So I want to, towards the end, um, I'm going to come back to another aspect of things. And that is, um, the, I mean, justifiably so, there is a lot of focus on building, um, of getting women in science and astronomy in particular. And you have also participated in that International Astronomical Union has uh, has a division, I think, uh, that deals with that. Um, I mean, it's it's unfortunate that we have to talk about this, meaning to say that uh, in an ideal world, things would be balanced, things would be equal, all the opportunities would be equal, but that is not the case. How do you, so what do you think, what should we do? I mean, you are a role model. I mean, people can actually see you and that's actually amazing. But beyond that, what kind of steps should we take? What kind of things that we should think about in encouraging a uh, woman to participate in science. And, and this is this is the case everywhere, but this is particularly, this is even more acute in South Asia and places like Pakistan, for example, and things like that. So I think that's a good question. I mean, what's really interesting is, it was a few years ago now, maybe about seven, eight years ago, when I, I gave a talk at University of Karachi. And what I was amazed by actually was that in the class that I was talking to, in, in the years that I was talking to, the representation of women was probably better than it would be in the UK in, in undergraduate physics classes. Um, and there's many different reasons for that. Now, of course, when you looked at, um, with all due respect to the faculty, the demographics changed instantly, right, to back to exactly what you would expect. And that also is true in, in universities in the UK. Um, we're finding in astronomy that more and more women are interested in entering. Um, what we're finding, however, is that they leave uh, in greater rates than men do um, at all the various uh, juncture points, basically, at which you um, enter maybe your second postdoc, at which you might get your more permanent position. And I think uh, so so what I would say is that I think there's a lot of interest um, that that women have in physics and particularly in astronomy. Um, I think there can be socioeconomic effects with that. So I think often if you're coming from uh, a family that is not maybe quite so used to doing higher level education, you would face more barriers socially and culturally um, in order to enter. But if you're from a certain socioeconomic background, and I can say that with my Pakistani family, everyone everyone uniformly was super supportive of any career I would choose, anything I expressed an interest in, everyone from my mamus, my chachas, whatever would be like, and, and khalas and, and everyone else as well, would be like, well, we'll connect you, we'll connect you to this, we'll connect you to that, all of that. So it was never, familiarly, I never had anything in my way. Um, and, I, and that makes a massive difference, right? I mean, your family encouraging you to pursue what you're interested in is a very precious thing across all cultures, and it, it, it cannot be discounted because I think that's a massive part of it. But then there is the conditions that your workplace provides, and I think there is a lot of work to be done there. Women have different needs. Um, than men do in terms of feeling welcome, in terms of building their lives as well as their families when they enter the workplace. And across the world, we are not doing well on that front. Um, and it's very, or some places are doing okay in some aspects, some places are doing okay in other aspects, but uniformly there isn't a standard offer um, that we're giving women um, that says, you know what, we welcome many different paths here. It's very interesting because I look at the women that I have, um, that I host in my division, in the science division, so I'm really talking about scientists, active scientists here, very senior scientists here, um, and there is there is a lack of diversity in the kind of women that we retain, essentially. So generally, um, in terms of their socioeconomic backgrounds, in terms of the kinds of families that they come from, and in terms of the numbers of children that they have. So um, it's it's so so the level of support that various workplaces and not just ESA, this is all of the workplaces that contributed to them building their careers are not providing a good level of support. And certainly when I was a postdoc in the US, um, 
I remember a friend of mine um, was having a child. There's no maternity leave. Even now, it's difficult to get maternity leave as a postdoc, especially if you're a newly started postdoc in most institutions across the world. There are very few that properly provide for that. And for women, that's particularly important. It, it's bad for men as well, I agree. But um, there are ways that society is set up that means that more of them can can do well in the system than women can. And I honestly believe that if we don't give them a good offer on those fronts, then you're only going to get a few cases that come through because the subliminal message that women are being given is this isn't really for you, right? It's um you have to sacrifice a lot of things. Everyone has to sacrifice a lot of things. A lot of a lot of studying for academia, doing space science involves sacrifice. It does. It involves long hours. It involves being somewhat antisocial. It involves possibly being antisocial a little bit by nature. <laughs> I don't know, possibly. But um, but there should be enough in there that we allow people to see how they can build the kind of lives that they, a, a diverse range of lives that they might want to build. And it's not just affecting women, right? It means that we struggle to attract other forms of diversity as well. And the problem with that is, is that science is actually a creative area. People don't always realize that, but it requires creativity. And if you don't have people from different backgrounds contributing, you're actually missing out on 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 ideas you're missing out on ideas you're missing out on connections um you're missing out on potential paths that we should be exploring and that's a real shame and i remember reading um I, i'm probably going to get this horribly wrong but i remember reading a quote by abdul salam saying that you know um bringing in sort of having more people from african american backgrounds um uh, other other backgrounds that we don't traditionally see in physics and astronomy, it would be like um, getting jazz, right? Essentially, it's like, it's essentially, it's that's what we're looking for, right? That's what we should be aiming for. And um, and I have completely butchered that that illusion, but um, <laughs> but feel free to look it up because he did say a beautiful quote about that. But, um, but and I absolutely believe that. I believe that you don't get ideas. You don't get ideas if you don't have a range of people sitting there properly, openly brainstorming. Um, we need to get away. There's this horrible idea about that, you know, science is done by one brilliant guy sitting alone in a room who's basically excluded everything around him just to, to get to this brilliant idea. That is not how science works. It involves so many ideas. It involves going to conferences. It involves talking to people. It involves reading lots, reading around your subject, reading other subjects to get inspired. And getting more people with different ideas on 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 around the table sitting together talking openly and if we don't do that we don't get to do exciting things um and so so that is my pitch for diversity but um but i think ultimately it comes down to being able to treat humans um and being able to treat their needs in better ways than we currently do and and i think there's still a lot of work to be done on that front like a lot of work because i'm not detecting that there's a problem in terms of interest there are a lot of women out there girls out there that are excited by this that have great ideas that are great at maths that are good at physics um and good at things around that but they need to know that this is a path that will accommodate them and what they want for their lives that's great and 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 i and i, and I really love your point about sort of like why you need diversity right i mean like you know about the diversity of ideas that that is actually crucial and uh both from ethnic and but also socioeconomic aspects and all of those things i think uh i think that's actually really wonderful although i should mention that and even though this is pretty bad in astronomy but astronomy is amongst the sciences yeah. slightly better not the biology i think it's it's better but astronomy has a pedigree because of the computers the women who actually map yeah. out stars and there are uh, there are stellar astronomers if i can use the pun uh, uh you know who are women and so on and so forth so unlike physics for example or a lot of other fields which are chemistry you just do not see anybody other than Marie Curie, for example and stuff like that but in astronomy actually there are examples and yet and yet when you look at, especially at the level of faculty positions yeah. and things like that, it just completely dries out. 
So, so thank you very much. That's actually really nice. Before we go, one last thing, and that is because you had mentioned that you got interested, uh, or or at least you were always interested in the sciences because of science fiction. So, tell us a little bit, like you know, which science fiction and what should people read or watch or what should we do? <laughs> so, I mean, everyone everyone has their own uh, favorite thing. I mean, I'm very old fashioned, so I love the classic era of science fiction. So, of course, uh, Asimov, Arthur C. Clarke, all of that stuff. I mean, Foundation series, the robot series, all of that stuff blew my mind. But then there was also the, um, oh God, what was um, the guy who wrote... Um, Johnny Mnemonic, uh, well, yeah, cyberpunk stuff. So William oh, Gibson. Oh, cyberpunk stuff, uh, William yeah, Gibson, yeah. yeah. So yeah. William Gibson. But then lately I've been getting into, um, the really, uh, it's fun and quite technical science fiction. There's a guy who wrote The Martian and I just read- um, Andrew uh, Veer, uh, what's his name? The Martian Yeah, Andrew guy, Veer, right? exactly, yeah. yeah. And I just read Project Hail Mary, which was just really, really fun. I thoroughly recommend it. And there is an ESA person in there, so that was super exciting. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but it's essentially about trying to save humanity. And, um, but it's, it's, it's really fun science fiction because it, it's sort of talking about maybe near future. It's talking about kind of where we think we're headed, uh, but it brings in real physics and engineering into it. And, um, and that is super fun for a nerd like me. So I really enjoy <laughs> that. But I really, I mean, what I love is the inspirational kind of science fiction, right? The part that makes humanity think of what could we achieve if we think long-term. Um, there's a lot of depressing science fiction out there too, and that's not really my bag. I have to <laughs> There's too much about life that's depressing. You don't, I don't need that. I read genre fiction to be inspired. And um, and I, I get a lot of that from science fiction even now. That's that's so great to know. Uh, I mean, sometimes, and this is a completely bad way of thinking, but sometimes people do think like, you know, the science fiction you only read when you are young and not later. <laughs> no, it's actually, science fiction is actually giving you a lot of ideas, a lot of thoughts and uh, and imagining sort of like, you know, what the world can be like. So that is that is wonderful. Uh, well, Dr. Sen, thank you so much for your generous time. And um, and it is so great to know about it. And and we'll certainly do a follow up interview in eight years once Juice <laughs> gets to Ganymede. But no, we, we will do some interviews before <laughs> we, that. We as have well. a few missions coming up in between, <laughs> I should tell you. <laughs> In fact, Euclid, right? Euclid's coming up next. So, <laughs> can, can you can you uh, say briefly what that mission is? Euclid. So, Euclid is looking at the other scale, essentially. So, it's looking right back to the um, uh, understanding cosmology. It's understanding our universe, and it's essentially going to be probing the nature of dark matter and dark energy, which basically makes up most of the universe. Um, I believe you covered that also in previous videos. So the fact that we only see about 5% of the universe means that there is a good 95% that we have yet to characterize. And so Euclid will be conducting a very detailed experiment to understand uh, what dark matter is and really test theories of what dark matter really is and test the current theory of what dark matter is but it will also probe dark energy which is this mysterious component of our universe that is accelerating the expansion of the universe um but it only seems to have kicked in in the later form of a formation of the universe so so we need to understand it better and we need to characterize it better and it's going to be doing um producing measurements that are significantly better than what we can get on the ground because you get very stable beautiful uh data sets from from space and so it's going to be out at um uh, a few million miles uh kilometers from from earth and at a very stable orbit and it's got a six-year experiment at the end of which we will hopefully get a much better understanding of what has happened in the last um 10 10 billion years essentially of our universe and, <laughs> so and what is that what is the expected launch date uh so we're hoping to launch this summer 
So it nope. should, okay. with any luck, we we haven't. We're we're launching with SpaceX on a Falcon Nine, so that's our first European Space Agency's first science mission, at least to launch um, with SpaceX. So that's an interesting uh, endeavor in itself, and. Um, and we have yet to announce the date, but probably it'll be happening this summer. So stay tuned. With Great. We will we will keep an eye on that. Well, Dr. Sen, thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks a lot. Thanks for your time. Bye.